Good morning. My name is James Little, and today I will we'll be presenting a Wiley Spectral webinar, a part of a five-part series. This one will be creating and sharing user EI and MSMS MS libraries. I am from Kingsport, Tennessee. I'm currently a retired research fellow from East Bend Chemical Company, but I recently started with 42 years experience with unknown identification, reverse engineering, and problem solving involving the use of primarily mass spectrometry, but many other techniques. I'm now a consultant for MS Interpretation Services. It is a company that is just incorporates only myself. On my website, there are many other specialties that I did as part of my work at Eastman Chemical Company that you might find interesting. Eastman Chemical Company, and this is the Kingsport site, which I worked at for 42 years, is in Kingsport, Tennessee. About six to 7,000 employees are on this site, with additional ones being in 50 additional manufacturing sites around the world. Previously, we talked about spectral searches with the NIST search, structure searches, using ANVIS for processing complex files, for sending spectra to the NIST search, the advanced NIST hybrid search, but today we'll talk about creating and sharing user EI and mass spec tandem type libraries. Note, all the handouts for all the sessions are online and you can find them on my website. In addition, the videos are online also for viewing for the previous sessions. If you came to the previous sessions, you'll note that I didn't have tables of contents for the handouts. And I looked at it and decided this wasn't a good idea because they had gotten to be a little large and I was afraid it would be difficult to find things within the, the handouts. So I created a table of contents for all of them. And now they've all been updated on the website if you'd like to have this copy with this, this additional capability. I want to emphasize that there's a lot of help files for the NIST search available from NIST. There's online help. If you hover on things, it tells you what it does. But also there's a lot of things on my website, additional resources for the different topics that we've discussed. So what I'm presenting in the, on the online videos are really just an overview of things. You'll need to go and study some of the handouts and learn additional things if you want to get better at doing mass spec interpretation of unknowns. The NIST software in general is very Windows compliant and I put some of the common commands here that you wouldn't want to use. Today we'll be using one of the ones I use a lot is the control key and then the left mouse button to select multiple things that you want to either delete possibly or if you want to put them somewhere else in another part of the program you can do the more than one entry at a time using the control key and the left mouse button to select multiple entries. So now I'd like to go do a live demonstration of adding a spectrum to a user library. So let's go to the NIST MS search program. And we discussed this in detail in the other presentations. So as you remember, the top one is the workspace. This is where you import spectra into the program for processing, whether you're searching, searching for structures, or you, in this case, you want to create a user library or user, or user spectrum to go in a user library. So the first thing you'll notice is I have Let's say this is a sample that some customer has submitted and we've got through analyzing. We think we want to possibly add it to our corporate mass spectral database. Well, you notice the first thing, it has some information about where it came from, but it doesn't have a structure associated with it. So the first thing we need to do is associate a structure with this unknown before we add it to the library. So we'll go to our structure drawing program. I've already drawn the structure here. We'll need to select it. You can either circle it or just click on it, but select the structure I want and say edit, copy. And that puts it in the Windows clipboard so it's ready to go over and be placed inside the NIST software. So we'll come back here. What we want to do is make this show up or uh, correspond with this spectrum. So to do that, if you look at the bottom, you have to go to the librarian tab. So we'll go to the librarian tab and select it again so it's highlighted i left mouse clicked on it and then go to the edit button if you hover here it'll say edit spectrum so we'll edit the spectrum as i said before we put it in the clipboard so all you have to do it's a little sad here but if you put from the from clipboard 
It'll bring the structure into focus. Now it's ready to add to the spectrum. What we'll want to do is calculate the formula and the molecular weight. The program does that for you automatically if you just say from structure, it pops into place. The other thing is I might always want to put some comments. So you could put synonyms if you knew this was called a uh, plant material 893, uh, stabilizer, could have a common name, 1010. So you could put more than one synonym that you could retrieve things in the name search. The other thing I'd like to do is put some comments about where it came from. Often when I'm doing files, I'll be doing five or six components within that same file if it's a GCMS run. It gets very tiring and very inefficient to have to copy the comments or type them in manually every time. So I always keep Notepad open. It's a very simple program, doesn't take a lot of resources. And I put the, what I want to add to the spectrum there. I just select it and say copy. So I select it and then right clicked on it and said copy. Now it's in the Windows clipboard. And we'll come over here and place it, just paste it in here. So now it's ready to go. So you can do that very quickly that way and only type it once and then add what you want to to your spectrum. But before we add this to the, our library, I want to take a look at it from a point of quality. We usually always look at it several ways to make sure it's a reasonable spectrum. So we'll, we'll do that. But uh, So I'll do that first. I'll say add to list. When we get ready to add to library, we will click on the add to library button here at the bottom of this box. But this time we'll just add it to the list. We've got our structure connected to our spectrum. And we'll go back to the window. And you can see now that we have now have the structure. Our comments have popped in here. We have our molecular formula, molecular weight. It's looking good to add to the library. We just want to do a little quality check on it. So one thing I normally do is I search all our databases, including our corporate database and the other databases to make sure that it wasn't already in there. So by exact structure, because it might have searched by the spectrum. You searched it and you found that you didn't have a good hit, but maybe your spectrum is not correct and someone's already added the correct one, or maybe someone has already added it and theirs is incorrect. So I want to search an exact structure. So as you remember from our previous one on structure searches, the inchy key, allows you to do an exact structure search. And I will say, okay. And then I'll say, go. Remember you have to use the go button for a library search, not a structure search since we're doing an inchy key and say, okay, and that's good. It didn't show up here. So that's a good indication that we have never seen it and no one else has ever seen that structure and had a corresponding spectrum for it. So that's good news. The other thing that I would like to do is I'd like to send it to the MS interpreter for interpretation to make sure all the fragments make sense. So I'll right click on it and say send to MS interpreter. It'll open the other program. Let's bring up our isotope, isotope ratio box. Again, we'll have to get the settings set up and that's in the handout for the structure search if you don't remember how to do that. So we have that in place. So if you'll remember, the little yellow marks tell you the isotopes are are correct and that shows that there's two of five structures look up here two of five and I'm going to click through all of them uh, just to see if they all make sense some of them are somewhat redundant because it's just ripping fluorines off in different places but the isotope ratios look pretty good for that everything the majority of things are in black which are the straightforward type ions that the MS interpreter can easily determine what they are the yellow shows additional ions that might take a little bit more uh, rearrangements to get there, but still can be explained. The white ions are the only ones that cannot be explained. So it looks pretty good. The only thing I don't really like down here, it looks like I didn't do a very good job of extracting the spectrum from the data file. It looks like I picked up some water at 18 and 17 and maybe 28 and 32 for oxygen and nitrogen and, and oxygen. So we need to clean that up. So when we go back to the library before we add it, we'll clean that up a little bit. But all the ions have been explained. Uh, to my satisfaction, if you look at the molecular ion, I'm going to check its isotope ratio. So I selected it. You can see the, you go up here and say right click, send to the isotope calculator, and it's a good match. The black is the, the observed, and the other 
the colored ions are the ones theoretical based on the molecular formula. So everything looks good. So in general, we've searched the library uh, by structure. We've already searched by spectrum to find it's not in there previously when we first brought it in, which I didn't demonstrate today, but you checked it by MS interpreter. So we're good to go. We're glad, glad we can now add it to the database, to our library. So let's go back to the NIST program. So we've got it ready to go. So we're going back, remember at the bottom, we're going to the librarian tab and we're coming up, picking the one we want. That's the top one that we just correlated the spectrum with the structure and we've checked the quality. Again, we'll go to the edit button and say edit spectrum. What we want to do is get rid of this uh, ions. We see these ions for water at 18, 17, 16, and 28 and 32. So we're going to select those. So I'm using, as I said before, I'm, I'm holding the control button. I put, push the left mouse button to get 16, 17, 18. I'll jump to 28. And we'll get rid of the 32 ion for the uh, nitrogen and for the oxygen from the air. You'll notice there's no delete key there. There's no delete key on the keyboard. Most of the NIST programs have a place to delete. So this one, you'll have to use the delete key on your keyboard and I'll say delete. And now you'll notice that these ions have disappeared. When we go back to the real display, you'll see they're gone also. So we're actually ready to add this to the library. So let's add to library. Let's pretend like this is the first time that we've ever put it into the library. If, you, if it was already there as a library that you had created, you would just select it and add it. But we're, this is the first time, so we'll say uh, first time, we'll call the database first time, and just say, okay. And it's done. So it's been added to the, our library called first time. So it's ready to search. The only thing is you have to recreate the indices for them the first time you create a library. If you don't exit the program, the program is not currently, will not know about this library called first time. So we will first go up here to the options and we'll say library spectrum comments tools. We'll go to the tools menu and we'll say update the list of the libraries. When you do that, it'll automatically bring in that library name first time and now the date the program will know about it the other way to do that is to exit the program and come back in but that's the way to do it without exiting the other thing you'll need to do if you want to do a structure search of your library you'll have to create the structure indices for that so you'll have to say rebuild it'll open a window for you here it's hidden behind went to the other my second monitor so i'll bring it back into focus here and you have to select uh, first time. You'll notice it's not in cap letters, so it means that it needs to be updated and say build. And when you get through, you exit, and it'll take you back and focus you in. The other things you might want to update are the hybrid search and the inchy key. If you want to do an exact search or do a hybrid search, or if you added a retention indices, if you wanted to, you can add your own retention, retention indices, you would need to update these. But now it's pretty much ready uh, to be used. It's a, a library that you can use and share and search and share with others. So that's pretty much the basics of using the software that covers all the topics. So it's not really too hard to do after you get used to it. It's, you can do it fairly efficiently. So let's go back and talk about some other things about user databases by looking at PowerPoint. So I was talking about if you want to add more than one spectrum, it's very good to use your notepad. And I just want to reemphasize that it's a much more efficient way than trying to type it in every time when you have multiple entries. The other thing that you might want to do is to make your database easier to read when you bring it up into the window when you look at it as a result. You can add tags and we'll talk about tags. Tags are created by putting whatever tag you want to use if you want to have a field called chemist. You have to just put an equal and put whatever you want to in uh, double quotes so that you, it takes care of spaces that way. There's a whole thing in the manual about how to do that. But here's some typical 
tags that one might find interesting. And these will show up as separate line items. And when they are, they'll be removed from the comments display part of the display. So it'll clean things up in a sense. So let's look at one. So you also, when you do this, you have to create a comment field display and tell the software that you've created this comment tag. So you have to go into the options, pull down the menu and add these tags, the ones that we've added. So I added chemist, lab notebook number and analyst and then say, okay. So, so here's the, what it normally would look like. We have our component added to a library. We can see that we have our synonyms, whatever we put in there, but you can see all the comments show up here. But after you create those tags in the pull down menu such that the software will know about it, now when it comes up, it'll look a little easier to read in a sense. You'll have your chemist broken out as a separate line, the laboratory notebook number, the analyst, and then anything that's left over that wasn't tagged, they'll be listed in the comment. Of course, it also creates the inchy key when you do these things also, which is nice for searching for exact structure. The software does that automatically. And it also calculates an estimated retention indices automatically for your compound. We're comparing to the ones in the database that NIST already has for experimental and literature values. The same thing is really for the Wiley libraries. The Wiley library, you can think of it as a user library because it's not created by NIST. So they refer to it as a, a user library also as far as how it works. So if you, if you get the Wiley libraries, it comes with certain tags like spectrum ID, the source of where they found it in the literature, classification, et cetera. But these must be added by the user to display these properly. So you have to go in and where I added mine, you'll need to add all of these. And it doesn't show all of them because you've got to scroll to see them all. But now I have all of mine that I like, plus all the one that Wiley has. And then when it comes up, you'll see now Wiley before it would have all of these in the comment, but now it brings the spectrum ID out, the source out, the classification, et cetera, into separate fields. So it's a much nicer way to display things when you're looking at the results of a search in their Wiley spectra. Also the codes for the source of the spectra are found in the Wiley user man manual, but I've also included a copy of that on my website if you want to see. So it'll tell you when you see this source what that uh, code means. And I need to remind you, after you create a user library, I'll just say this once again, a critical step is you have to create index files to have these libraries properly searched. Only the simple library identity search will work without this step. And remember, you go to the tools option, pull it down and say, rebuild whatever one you want to build, like the structure index probably is a good one. The hybrid's a good one, the inchy key. And if you add a retention indices, also that. And you need to, if you want to see your library of something, when you create a new library, you need to say update list of libraries so it will know that your library exists. So it'll bring it in. If not, you'll have to exit the program and every time the program starts back up, it looks for additional libraries that might have been added since the last time the program was utilized. We started our libraries around 2000, the NIST libraries. Our libraries actually go back to 1978, and they were in several different formats before we, we settled on using the NIST search. But the NIST search ones were started around 2000. As I say again, we're a, a large company but we have many, many sites. There's 50 manufacturing sites. So it's very important that we share information with one another on development projects, on environmental samples, et cetera. So that's a very important thing for our company. We've put a lot of time into doing that, but we think it's, it's we know it's very well worth the effort. So we have about 50 GCMSs worldwide and they're all networked, whether they be GCMSs, LCMSs, accurate mass instruments, et cetera. And as a part of that effort, we have a NIST search library now of EI and MSMS user libraries. It contains about 60,000 of our own EI and about uh, 3,000 tandem spectra. 
you might say, well, that's not too large, is it, compared to, we have a million things that we buy for NIST and Wally, but these 60,000 things are very important to us. There are things that we found in our samples, we found in competitive samples, there are environmental things. We even add things to the library that might not even know what they are, but we know what process they came from. So if they show up, they have a spill somewhere in the plant, and you see it goes into the river here, then as soon as we detect it, we have a very strict monitoring program. We'll find the chemical, we have a mass spec in the environmental lab, in a short period of time, we'll notice by the carbon detectors, we have a problem, they'll sample it, they'll run the mass spec, and it, they'll know exactly where it came from. So if it came from, let's say this building right here, just because we don't even know what it is, but we know it's part of that process because that's listed in the comments, then they can quickly cut off any effluent that might be going to the interceptor sewers to stop problems. So it's a very key part of our operation for R&D and also for environmental efforts. How does it work? It's, it's very inexpensive. Most things you think when you buy something that's network like this, it might be very expensive, but it's, it's very inexpensive. The only expense is our time. We have to have a standard corporate network and associated servers. And then we have users that create the data. They run them in their separate laboratories, whether they be GC laboratories or another remote site. And then what they do is if they usually just push the button and see if it's in the library, but if it isn't, they send an email to the people at our Kingsport site, at the expert site, and we'll, we'll interpret the things for them, send them a uh, file back that shows them the results, usually a PDF file with annotated chromatograms with structures, and they, then the expert will add them to the library. When they add them to the library at every night, It'll send it to the library over to the corporate server. And also after it finishes doing its work, it will also always gets things back. And on our corporate server, once a night, it merges all our user libraries because we have maybe more than three or so people that maybe add things to the library. It sends the merge copy back to the server. And it also archives it automatically, puts a time stamp on it. So if someone changes something and it gets there's a problem that shouldn't have been changed. And we, every day we have a time stamp, time stamped file or library that has everything we'll have in it. And then after every night, it also, this actually says it'll get alive. So the user's computer will tell it to get alive and it'll get this merged library and put it down. So the next morning when they come in, they'll have the newly updated library with all their entries that can be searched, but also all the other people that might be interested within the corporation can find their results also. How does this work? Well, you write DOS files to you. DOS is a pretty old operating system and it's really not an operating system anymore. It's really just an application on your current computer, but it still can write commands that can do things. And these commands can talk to the NIST software. The NIST software, uh, lib to NIST and other utilities have handles that these DOS programs can address and do things. And you manage the timing of all this by just an inexpensive Windows scheduling program. You just tell it to every night to, to merge the libraries, get the libraries. All of these DOS commands are done by scheduling programs. So that's very inexpensive. And it automatically merges all of the user libraries, distributes them automatically, and archives them daily. Uh, no interaction of the user at all in that regard. And then the next day is the additions and any new entries are available to all users worldwide. So this is what a typical DOS script file would look like. It usually has some comments at the top and then it has some more comments. I always write a lot of comments when I write files in general to remember what they do. And then you just start having commands. Uh, anything that doesn't have a dot in front of it's a command. So it checks some things about aliases and then it does all the copies and it just goes through and they're pretty easy to write. I'm not a computer programmer and I wrote all of these. And after you have them as templates, it's easy just to modify them for additional users to be added to the system. And these are all available on my website. There's a whole section about how one would write this network software and set it up. So it's, it's really a very, very valuable thing to our corporation to have this. I don't really know how we would operate without it after you become accustomed to this capability, it'd be really difficult to not have it. 
Also, I talked about earlier, there's a lot of other topics. There's manuals here, there's things that I have done, but they're all, if you hover here, you'll see in the PDF files, they're all linked to some website somewhere that will give you additional information. Acknowledgements. Uh, I wanted to thank the people from Wiley. If Ryan and Kristen hadn't worked with me, I would have never had the initiative to make any of these video productions for my YouTube channel. I would not have been able to, I have never would have taken the initiative to make the handout. So thank you for their patience with me and guidance during this process. Had a lot of help from a lot of people, David Sparkman, Steve Stein, the people from NIST, uh, people from our place, the people from Agilent. So it, a lot of people went into developing this process that we've used since about 2000, 2001. We've been doing this nightly. So that's a lot of times, 365 times a year uh, for 20 years. It just runs in the background, does its job. Really, really not, never lost any data, never really had any problems. It just seems to work. So I hope you might find this useful. If not, just at least create your own user library that you can share with others. You don't have to make it very elaborate and have a corporate thing to, to just archive your own data for future use so you don't forget something you've identified or have something that you don't know what it is, but you've already characterized. A lot of times we'll just add things to the library, like I said, that we don't know exactly what they are, but we know what data we have for them, whether so if you come back later, you might be smarter that day and figure out what it is. So we try to archive things with the information we have to date. And also it's very useful for environmental things. At least you know where it came from. So some people might say, well, it's dangerous to add things to a user library. Some, someone might think that's what it is and that you might be wrong. Well, you could, but there's, there's things wrong in the Wiley and NIST library. You should really think of libraries as an aid to identification. They're not the final word. You need to consider sample history, talk to your customer. Lots of different things go into an identification of a species, but the, lab, the database library search is just the start. It gives you things to think about, but then after that you have to use uh, good instincts to decide if that's what it is before you just say that's what it is. So I hope you'll find all the information we've done in all the series useful. If you have any questions, my email's on the top of the handout. Feel free to send me some questions and I'll do the best I can to answer them for you. So thank you for your time. Good day.